give you a little bit about who I am, how long I've been doing it, what are some of my focus areas. Uh, I've been keeping honeybees for 17 years. I know that because my son is 16 and I started the year before he was born. So, um, right now, we float. The minimum number of colonies I like to keep is 45. The upper number is about 65. So I float between that. I run the operation by myself, so I manage everything. I work a full-time job and I do all the colony management. My wife handles all the honey. <laughs> Of course, I process the honey and put it in a bottle for her, but she does all the marketing, sales, and account management. So we make a lot of honey. That's kind of our focus. In addition to making honey, we make a lot of queen bees. I was involved in a uh, grant activity with the USDA to breed BSH queens, grow a sense of hygienic queens. As part of that process, we had a collaborative agreement with Baton Rouge, the lab, the bee breeding laboratory down in Baton Rouge, where we were given germ plasm straight out of the lab. So we got virgin queens and drone semen straight out of the lab. So um, I have instrumental insemination equipment. I was taught by Sue Kobe, who was kind of the, the mother of instrumental insemination. Uh, I took her class down at the uh, University of Florida in Gainesville. Uh, it was a wonderful class, best, best experience I ever had in beekeeping. Uh, she is a master, a true master. So we have the equipment to do instrumental insemination. Uh, we have made a, a good number of breeder queens ourselves, and I propagate them annually. And I, I monitor the productivity, the varroa mite counts, that's important to us. We'd like to run as close to uh, treatment-free as possible. Uh, and, uh, so those are some of our objectives. Making a lot of honey, making a lot of very productive bees. They go hand in hand. Um, for those people who are kind of just starting out, I would consider this skill here is probably one of the most important things that you can master in beekeeping. I know when I first started, making queens was a bit of a mystery to me. Once I start kind of digging my hands into what are some of the things you can do to make queens, I started to see my beekeeping skills really jump up. And as a result of that, my colony started to look a lot better. So before that, my bees were kind of ratty. They were just, you know, man, just struggling to get through. After I invested a lot of effort in them making queen bees, my colony was great. Most years they were fantastic. So this is an important class. I'm not trying to pump myself up, but hopefully you'll get something good out of this. Uh, I would like this to be interactive, so if you have questions, please ask. No question is a dumb question. Just ask if something's, if something's not clear, if I go too fast, just raise your hand. We'll get a question out there, and everyone will benefit from that. So uh, real quick, this is the agenda. Um, we're going to start out with some basic objective of the course, uh, talk some between your own biology, um, this one right here is, is the money slide right here. So production of queen cells. We're going to really focus on making good queen cells. Not the kind of queen cells you make from a cut down split or a walk away split. Not those queen cells. We're making monster queen cells. And I'm going to try to motivate that by some real research that's out there that size matters. So that's going to be right before launch. Right after launch, I'm going to hit you with part two of that. I'm going to talk about two different queen cell production methods. One that's based on just a five frame nuke, and the other that's a little bit bigger. I've scaled it down from a very popular methodology out there, and uh, we'll talk about that. So I call it the mini MP. MP, if you don't know, there's a very famous beekeeper out there. I think he's one of the best in the country. His name is Michael Palmer. He is absolutely fantastic. So I call it the mini Michael Palmer method. Um, after that, we're going to do some uh, discussion on grafting. Of course, this class is trying to focus on grafting. We're going to talk about grafting. And for those that struggle with the grafting, I don't want that to be a total obstacle. So we're going to talk about very briefly another non-grafting technique. Of course, once you make these great cells and great virgin queens, they have to be mated. We're going to talk about some options on mating 
uh, the various nukes and uh, making yards. And the, the end of the thing is going to be basically some miscellaneous stuff. So if there are no questions, I'd like to go ahead and just kind of kick things off. Uh, I'm in Suffolk, sorry. Oh, Suffolk, yeah. okay. Yeah, uh, Chuckatuck area, Suffolk, for those of you who don't know, it's up near Smithfield. Um, and we've been in that same place the entire time I've kept behind uh, these. Can everyone see the slides well back there? No? Ruth, can this go the higher? Is there enough light oh. from the back? Coming in? I think more, it's more height. You can elevate it a little bit. It's height? Yeah, it's height.
Why do we want to do that? Because that's when colonies naturally start to make queens. You want to work with nature. You want to work in conjunction with nature, not against it. Making queens in the end of July when it's 95, 105 degrees out here, that's hard. Making queens when your bees are swarming, much easier. You're going to have a much higher quality product. Um, key question and final determination can be only made by the beekeeper looking at their colonies, right? I can't say March 20th start grafting. Everyone graft on March 20th. No, can't do that. You have to go into your colonies, look at how your colonies have come out of winter, how they're building up, how much brood they have, what's the population, and then you can make an assessment. Is this sufficient resources for me to do what I need to do uh, from what you're going to learn today, all right? So what you should look for when you open these colonies, you have to see drone brood, minimum. That's like, if you don't see drone brood, there's a problem. Um, uh, I like to see more than drone brood. If you go online and you type in the question, when should I start making queens? Someone will say, oh, when you see purple-eyed drum brood. I'm like, really? <laughs> you want to send out this beautiful queen you just made to the five drones that happen to be out there? No. I want to see lots of drones inside the hive. Not the young furry drones. I want to see mature drones on the outside honey frame. So when I pull that first frame out, I want to see drones on that frame. I want to see drones flying in and out of the colony. So drones are actively flying. And I want to see lots of worker brood. Six to seven deeps of brood. I run deep frames. I start before the mediums were in vogue. So everything I have basically is deeps. So what's that translate into for me? You're probably going to look at about uh, 10, 11 frames of mediums. And this is a good one right here. Reports of local swarming. That's a good indicator. If you have a club, I recommend all you participate in clubs. If you have a club that has a swarm list, you may not get the call, but just ask the swarm coordinator, hey, have you heard about swarming yet? If they say, yeah, we've gotten 10 of the swarm calls already, that's a good thing. That gives you an insight into what are your local conditions that are conducive for making good queens. So here's the thing that will bite me in the butt. Most years in Hampton Roads, conditions begin towards the end of March. Right? So in this area, I'm rearing queens sometime in the last week of March, typically. Okay? Don't mark a calendar. And say, Sean says, make queens in the March. But uh, that's a, a pretty good indicator. We've already talked about this a little bit. Make queens when the bees want to make queens. Forcing bees to make queens in July and August is very, very hard. I do it sometimes, but I've done this long enough. I know what it takes to do it. Don't try to do this your first year. Um, Swarm cells are the gold standard. That is, when we make a queen cell, we want it to look like a swarm cell or a nice supersedure cell. I'm going to show you some queen cell differences here later on today. Don't expect to rear 30 plus queens without putting some effort into making drone bees. Drones and queens, 50% each. So you can't make a beautiful product on one side and totally neglect the other. For beekeepers making five, six queens, it's probably not a big deal. Yes, Christine. How would you increase your drone production? Put in drone frames and drone wax? Yeah, so uh, we're going to talk about that later, but real briefly, if you uh, want to increase the number of drones in your colony, typically what I do, um, I take this right here, empty wooden frame. I go into the colony I've chosen to be my drone mother, and I'll find out where that interface is between the last brood and the first pollen frame. I'll 
drop that right in between. You'll be amazed how fast it draws out. Total drones. Now, that's assuming you're running foundation. There's a movement sometime around the country to run foundationless, and they'll have a lot of natural drone comb already. I run a strict foundation, so when I give them open space, they totally fill this with drones in about a week. So that's how I recommend making drones. And you'd like to spread those around if possible. I mean, this is backyard beekeeper, so you may not have access to out yards. But if you do, I strongly recommend moving your drones around your mating areas. Uh, I don't want to get ahead in Sean, but how do you balance creating drones with using drone cells as part of our IPM? You know, a lot of us do that and then cut them out because that cuts down on my population. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of counterproductive if you want to raise queens, too. It is, uh, but there's a price to pay here. You have to have drones. There's no way around that, right? Now, the drone mother colony you've chosen, I would hope that there's some inherent varroa resistance of that colony. If that colony is dirty with varroa, that'd be a bad choice. So, I think there's a trade-off there. You're going to make varroa whenever you're allowing drones to emerge. That's a given, but there's a balance there. You want to select the really quality queens in your yard, the quality, co quality colonies to make not only the queens, but also the drones. Again, we're going to talk about this. a 50-50 deal here. When you make a queen, it get genetic material from both sides. Yes? Isn't it true, though, that the queen is not mating with the drone in her own hive? She's going to a drone congregation area, hopefully nearby. So you're counting on natural supply of good drones. True. That, that's why I said don't expect to rear 30 queens. I said you can rear a handful of queens without doing anything with respect to drones. But if you're going to ramp this up to making 25, 30 queens, you should probably not just solely rely upon the native population. Okay? So, yeah. Any question? Yeah, I mean, doesn't the queen fly twice as far as the drones from her, her brothers, yeah, in other I, words? Yeah, it's, it's difficult for a backyard beekeeper to control mating. It's difficult for anybody to control open mating. So let me just be perfectly clear there. I'm not suggesting a backyard <coughs> beekeeper can control open mating. It's not possible. So, yes, she flies different radius than drones fly from given yard, but there have been documented cases where queens will mate in the yard they flew from. People have witnessed that. Yes? Hey, you sell drone production hive. Now that's separate from your queen production hive? That is totally separate. In fact, you intentionally make that separate because if you choose drones from the same column, that's that emanate from the same queen that you're using for grafting, you're essentially making an inbreeding condition there. So you want to have separate colonies, hopefully enough genetic diversity, such that we don't ultimately get into an inbred condition. We'll talk more about that. Okay, leveraging nature. That's the whole thing here about making queens. We want to leverage what the bee's instincts are. Bees make queens under three conditions. Supersedure, swarming, and emergency. Supersedure is not super important in this class. Um, it's a natural occurrence, of course, when a queen is failing, the bees um, go out of their way to make a queen. So they plan the re replacement. They generally make very, very nice cells in a supersedure condition. You'll have a big monster cell on a frame. Swarming, that is what we're trying to emulate in this class. Uh, so it's a very important concept here. Uh, swarming can occur uh, based on many factors. Of course, it's a natural reproductive cycle of a colony. Uh, 
when abundant resources are present, typically in spring, when there's a large number of nurse bees in the brood chamber. I want everyone to remember that element, when there's a large number of nurse bees in the brood chamber. That's what we're going to be making today. That's, that's what we're targeting right there. We want this overcrowding with these large number of nurse bees. That's the secret sauce, okay? We're trying to make swarming in a condition that has this large number of nurse bees. Um, in Bee Culture of 2018, there was an article that talked about swarming and they were able to identify colonies preparing to swarm tend to have a large proportion of young bees. So young bees go hand in hand with swarming. So uh, this is what we're going to be emulating. Emergency. Um, unfortunately, we can't really induce <coughs> swarming and control it very well. That's not what we want to do. We want to do something that simulates a swarm-like condition, but we want to give them graphs. So we're going to be very selective on the age of the larva we pick, the colony we choose to make the queen from. Uh, so we don't want to do that cut down split or walk away split, but we're going to have to use emergency-like uh, measures to get the cells built. But we're hoping we get the cell that will be built uh, in a swarming situation. So this, this red text down here basically says that we want our emergency queen cells to approach those made during swarm preparations or a super siege. So what are the ingredients of high quality queens? We use that term quality queens. Uh, we want to replicate as close as possible swarm like conditions. We need lots of young nurse bees, not only to induce that swarm like conditions, but we also want bees that are making lots of royal jelly. This is, there's no substitute for this. You can't get away from that. You absolutely need lots of young nurse bees in any cell building condition. Lots of pollen and nectar coming in is very helpful. If, you, if there's not natural sources for this, you have to provide it. There's no way around that. You have to start with quality queen stock if you're going to make quality queens. Ideally, there's quality drone sources nearby. Again, we can't necessarily control that, but we hope that's the case. I try to control that because I have, I've made a lot of queens and I have a lot of space to do so. So I have colonies in a two mile radius around my mating area and I'll put drone colonies sprinkled around my area to try to achieve good matings. And this is key right here. You have to use good cell building methods. You can't make good cells with very poor cell builder. Now, don't breed from your existing queens if, this is a little subjective, um, if your stock is st struggling to survive. If you're losing your colonies every year, there's either a problem with your management techniques or there's a problem with your genetics. Your queens are only lasting one year. That's a very poor lifespan. I mean, if your queens are failing repeatedly, I would seriously question whether or not you have good genetics, or there, maybe there's something else going on. Um, your honey harvests are consistently poor. Again, there's a fine line here between is it poor management or poor genetics. So you've got to kind of isolate which one it is. Uh, I would bring in different bees if I have consistently uh, for uh, honey production. Typically, we get on the order of 90, pound, 90 pounds of honey per colony. So um, we really go out of our way to make a lot of honey. If you're seeing poor mite resistance, if you're going into your bees in, say, August, and there's varroa mites all over your bees, if you're doing a, a sticky board uh, test, and you're getting a huge number of mites per day. If you do a, an alcohol wash or powdered sugar shake, you're seeing a large number of varroa. Uh, you should probably bring in different bees. Okay. Uh, if you're seeing different types of diseases, European fall brood is around. 
It is definitely around. Just learn how to diagnose that, because you may see it. If you keep bees long enough, I almost guarantee you'll see European fall brood. I get phone calls every year from beekeepers. Sean, I want you to come over and look at this hive. There's something wrong. I'll go there and almost immediately I'll see, okay, this is European fall brood. Um, chalk brood. Um, I've seen that once in one of my colonies. It was a wet spring, wet cold spring. I had an out yard that had a real direct path right to the wind off a river. So they had chalk brood. Not a big deal. But uh, <coughs> both of these are handled with uh, recleaning with different stocks. So equipment, you're gonna see a lot of equipment today. Uh, you have equipment in front of you, uh, but the essentials are you need that breeder queen, the mother queen, the, your best of the best kind of thing. That's what you're choosing. Uh, you need something to build the cells in, the cell building colony, and once you make those monster, beautiful, quality queen cells, you gotta get them mated. So there's you know, three basic ingredients here. The genetic source to make the cell and to get it mated. This can be a bit of a bottleneck, the, the mating nukes, because it does require bees. We're going to show you some things uh, that can reduce the burden on uh, how many bees you need to make the, the mating nukes. Of course, you don't need mating nukes. You can just requeen existing colonies or make splits and give them cells that you're making. There's optional equipment. Uh, you already have this one, the grafting supply, thanks to Ruth for doing that. Uh, you have the grafting uh, tool, you have cell cup, cell bar, uh, so you basically have it all. The grafting stand, uh, I have one here. It's just basically something to keep the, the frame at an angle so you can you know, see into the cells and pull the larva out. Uh, Yenter kit, uh, I have one here, that's a non-graftless -graft, kind of um, methodology. These other things are kind of self-protected, I don't use them that much. You need introductions, you need queen cages. Uh, queen candy is very important to have around, uh, and I like to keep my queens marked. I think that's important as well. So big picture on timing. Uh, day one, the egg gets laid by the queen. It hatches roughly at day three, three and a half, basically. So next day is day four. That's when we're in the colony and we're pulling that frame out. That's where we're seeking out the right age material to do the grafting. Uh, goes into the cell builder that same day. So a larva that's basically 12 hours old is what we're targeting. So go in your cell builder. Day eight of the development cycle, of the queen cells will be sealed. On day 14, that cell has to come out, and you've got to have a 